Tana Tova. I'm so looking forward to baking together as we join as a community and make delicious treats for Rosh Hashanah. Wishing everyone a very happy sweet new year filled with sweet and delicious things. On behalf of the Central Synagogue, I'd like to wish you all a Shana Tova, a happy and healthy sweet new year. May the unity created tonight elicit Hashem's richest blessings for Shana Tova for all involved. Welcome, I'm Dina from Kumon Synagogue. I want to give a special shout out to all our friends from our community and we're very excited to be joining Lisa and everyone else here tonight uniting in preparation for Rosh Hashanah. Hi everyone. So when the Torah talks about honey, it is usually referring to date honey. However, traditionally at this time of year, the honey that graces our Rosh Hashanah tables is bee honey. So may Hashem sweeten the sting of our day of judgment. May Hashem bless us all with a good year, good health, peace in our homes, peace in our community, peace in Israel, and peace in the world. Shana Tova, Ktiva Vachatima Tova, a good gebench de yor to all of us. Hi, I'm Rivka Rappaport from Kehilat Katima. Hope you all enjoy tonight's evening of cooking and looking forward to the day where we can do it together in person. Wishing you all a Shana Tova, a healthy and a happy sweet new year. Shana Tova. It's wonderful that we will all be coming together, even though it's virtually, to cook as a community. On behalf of Kehillat Masada, I'd like to wish you Shana Tova. We are from Wachadash. We wish you Shana Tova. Let's talk about deliciousness for Rosh Hashanah. We all know that we love at this time of year to make things with honey and dates and sugar and apples and all things that are going to help us have a sweet new year. And this is where I come in and I'm making two things tonight that I think are going to help in that department. First, we're going to make honey snap biscuits, which are one of my all-time favourite Rosh Hashanah biscuits since we've had them um, in the Monday Morning Cooking Club collection. What I love about them is that they're quick and easy to make. You can make a big batch, a small batch. They're great to send as gifts. They travel well, they pack well, and they last for ages. Not that in this house anything lasts. But they're a really great recipe. Now, the recipe originally comes with butter, okay? You can, of course, make it with margarine, and there are a few, thing, few things I'll talk you through as we make it because margarine is a different thing to butter, and it does impact different steps of the biscuit. While our dough is resting in the fridge, which it needs to, because if you don't rest it, what happens is you get tough biscuits, which we don't want. Uh, we want them to have a nice snap and be lovely um, and nice to bite. While they are resting, we are going to make a apple pie cake. Now, it's called an apple pie cake because it's sort of an apple cake, but it sort of looks like a pie. So it's an apple pie cake. And that's made with apple and honey, which is just perfect for this time of year. So I'm going to cook along with you, or you're going to cook along with me, hopefully, for the honey snap biscuits. And then I'm going to just demo the cake in the waiting time. And then we're going to roll our biscuits out together and bake them. They only bake for 10 minutes, so it's quick and easy. So let's start with the honey snap biscuits. And I'll run through the ingredients. And hopefully a lot of you are cooking along. Um, I, I can see the chat on the computer screen, so you're welcome to ask questions and I'll try to answer them as we go along if anyone has any cooking questions about what we're doing. So let's go through the honey snap recipe. Firstly, we need dry ingredients as follows. We need three cups of plain flour and I'm gonna put all the dry ingredients into a bowl because I need to combine them, okay? So I've got three cups of plain flour. I have one and a half teaspoons of baking soda or bicarbonate of soda and you know that that's a different thing to baking powder. Um, they're both rising agents, but baking soda needs to have something acidic like honey to make it rise. So it's a perfect thing for, um, for dishes with honey in it. Um, this is from, um, good question. This is from our most recent book, Now for Something Sweet. Both these recipes are actually. Julie, they're from Now for Something Sweet, the one that was published in 2020. Okay, so we've got our flour, our baking soda, and then we've got a half a teaspoon each of ground mixed spice and ground cinnamon and one teaspoon of my favourite ground ginger. And they're going into the mix of the dry ingredients. And we have a half a teaspoon of salt. Seems quite a lot in a sweet biscuit, but it really makes it 
something special. The salt just brings out the flavour and the sweetness. It's really essential. So half a teaspoon of salt. The recipe says to sift them together, but instead of sifting when we don't need lightness, like for a chiffon cake or something, I just put all the dry ingredients in a bowl like that, use a whisk and just mix it together. And that's a really good way to combine the dry ingredients. It saves you getting out a colander or a sieve. Okay, so I'm just combining my dry ingredients. Um, okay, so yes, Jeff has asked if it's possible to use wholemeal flour. Look, absolutely. You may need to add a little bit more liquid. You'll see how your, your um, dough goes. But yes, go ahead and we'll see how it turns out. Okay, so mix these dry ingredients together. Okay, if you're using salted butter, leave out the salt. That's a really good question. Um, I always cook with unsalted butter, and that actually reminds me, and thanks for that question, if you're using margarine that has salt in it, I would also leave out the salt, okay? I always use unsalted butter for baking, which is why I'm adding the salt, okay? If you don't have mixed spice, don't worry, just add your favourite spice. Cinnamon, ginger, nutmeg, cardamom, any of them will be lovely. Ground all spice works really well. Or just use the other spices in the same quantity. Okay, dry ingredients done. So many questions, it's great. Okay, will gluten-free flour work? You know what, I don't know because we need it to be a snappy biscuit and the gluten does something to help make it snappy. So I'm actually not sure. Um, about the gluten-free flour at this point. So, you know, give it a go and see how they work out. I think that's the only thing I can say at this point. All right, set the dry ingredients aside. We're now going to start with everything else, okay? So we need our butter or our margarine, and um, we're going to put that into a separate bowl. You can use your stand mixer. I'm going to use an electric mixer. I'm going to try to keep the the sound noise to a minimum for you. Um, you can do it by hand, but it's a bit of hard work. So if you're feeling like you want to give your arm a workout, by all means, get a wooden spoon and go for it. But I'm going to use this. Your butter needs to be softened. And that means, my description is this. If you can spread this on a piece of super fresh colour without tearing the colour, that is softened, okay? If it's going to tear the colour as you try to spread it, it's not soft enough. So stick it in the microwave or put it over the stovetop for a couple of seconds. It needs to be soft and, and able to be smeared, okay? I'm putting all my butter in and I have, let me just check, 185 grams of butter. If you're using margarine, I suggest you use it from the fridge because it goes soft so quickly, okay? Now the recipe says to cream the butter first, but my butter is so lovely and soft that I'm just gonna add my sugar to the butter now. So I have quite a lot, 220 grams, which is one cup of brown sugar. Brown sugar and butter in here. I'm gonna turn on the mixer for a sec. Sorry, just bear with me with the noise. And I'm just mixing it till it's really creamy, okay? It's only gonna take about 30 seconds. So everyone should be mixing either with your strong arm and a wooden spoon or in your stand mixer with the paddle beater or with a handheld like this. Okay, I want it to be nice and creamy. Remember though, brown sugar is never going to go as creamy as white sugar does. Okay, so don't expect that really pale creamy thing we get with white sugar. Um, it's going to be, you'll see, lovely and creamy but not the same. All right, let's go. Is everyone working hard? Together. Okay. Um, so I've used raw sugar, raw sugar, that should work absolutely fine. You are going to miss out on that flavour though that the brown sugar gives. Okay. So you can see it's already lovely and creamy. I'm just going to give it another 20 seconds on high speed just to really further if I wasn't doing this with you guys here and we didn't have time constraints I'd probably give it a good five minutes in the mixer and go and do something else while it's mixing but since we're all doing it together let's get it going quickly I'm going to turn it up okay. oh, see that Iris is those already in the fridge excellent all right 
right. I'm going to give this a scrape down, which you need to do whatever you use, whichever mixer you use, you're going to get mixture coming up the side. And now I'm going to add, this is my favourite kitchen tool, by the way, I had to just tell you this. This is a, a heat proof silicon spatula that I think every single time I step into the kitchen, I use it. It's fantastic. I've got one egg, which I'm going to add in now, and I'm going to add the honey as well. So one egg. And I have quarter of a cup of honey. Ideally, I would put this bowl now on the scales and I would measure the honey directly into it. It's just easier because, you know, honey sticks and it's hard to get out. The other thing you can do is spray this measuring glass with olive oil spray or oil or canola spray and then measure the honey into it and then it'll come out. And I measured mine this afternoon so it may stick a little bit. So I'm just going to put my honey in. Yum. And I'm going to give it another mix, okay? And then we're going to put away the electric beater and do the rest by hand. So just bear with me another minute. Okay. Now I just want it really well combined. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. That's it. Done. Can I get those back next to in a minute? Thanks. Okay, so here's my mixture. Okay, this is my butter, my sugar, my egg and my honey. And now I'm going to fold in the dry ingredients. And I'm going to put about half of the dry ingredients in. Just find it easier not to put it all in at once because then you're going to end up like mixing it and you're going to have flour all over your face and it's just much easier and more manageable to do it half a batch at a time. You could do it in the mixer. I think if you've got a stand mixer that can beat on slow, it's actually much better. Um, it's much easier, I should say. I feel like my hand mixers are a bit fast to do this the way I want. Okay. If you are using margarine, it's going to be a much, much softer mixture. And ideally, if you have time, it's better to leave the margarine dough in the fridge for a few extra hours because it is softer. Okay, what will happen is if you try to roll it out, you will have to use too much flour and then you get a really um, tough biscuit as well as one without the taste we want because all the spices have been diluted too much. All right, so it's just a matter now of mixing this until we have a dough, which is just going to be another minute or so. And it's already smelling like you want it to, to smell like you can smell the honey and the spices and I mean my mouth's already watering because I know what they taste like because I've made these for a long time and they're just such a great biscuit. Um, I've got a funny story actually last year in lockdown when Melbourne were in lockdown and my family's in Melbourne I sent family and friends packets of these biscuits and I sent them like I don't know how many were in a biscuit in a packet maybe you know 20 biscuits. I can't tell you how many people sent me like little messages and said and said just got a parcel and I've just opened it and I've just finished the bag. And um, that's the problem with these biscuits. They're so Moorish that you can't stop. Okay. So um, Juliana wants to know how creamy the butter and sugar has to be. I want it to be fluffy, um, not super fluffy because we are just making a biscuit, but definitely um, fluffier than it was when you first combined them. So just give them a couple of minutes with an electric mixer. Okay. It doesn't matter if you can still feel the crystals of the sugar, um, although with brown sugar you really won't, um, but you want it to be fluffy. All right, so here's my dough. I think that's just about done. You can see it's a really, really quick thing. And, you know, if you're doing this at home without talking or explaining things, you can see it's a thing that will just take you five minutes in the stand mixer. So I'm gonna then just put this into the fridge and the best thing that I like to do is just wrap it either in plastic wrap or you could do baking paper if you prefer. And I'm going to divide the dough in half just so I can roll them at different times and leave one in the fridge while I roll the other, okay? So I want to show you the dough, though. It's actually beautiful, okay? I can make a ball... I could roll it out now. And I did an experiment last week because the recipe says that it needs to sit in the fridge for two hours. 
And I wanted to see what would happen if I rolled and baked them straight away. And what happens is they work perfectly, but because the, dough, the flour hasn't rested and the gluten in the flour, um, it, it hasn't rested after being worked, it just makes a tough biscuit. So it really needs resting. And what I'm suggesting is that you take your dough now and let's pop it in the freezer and let it sit there for half an hour when we roll it. Okay, I'm gonna put one in the freezer and one in the fridge. And maybe you wanna do the same and we'll see which one's better to roll in half an hour. Okay, so, all right. Someone got a problem there. Uh, no, I think we're all good. Okay. Yeah, um, this biscuit dough is really, really yummy. If you're the sort of cook that likes to lick the spoon, as I may or may not be, um, this is very delicious. All right, here we go. I've just plastic wrapped into one inch of the freezer, one inch of the fridge, and we'll see them in about, well, we'll see how long it takes us to get this cake done. Okay, so when they come back, we're going to roll them out. I'm going to show you the dough that I made last night with margarine and you can see the difference. Okay. So that is the biscuit recipe. You can see how easy it is. And hopefully everybody's had time now to get these into the fridge and I hope they didn't go too fast. All right, let me get rid of this mess. It's very easy when you do these Zooms to forget about the mess and then before you know it, you can't see me because there's just so many dishes. So I'm trying to do this as I go along. Thank you so much. Okay, let's talk cake. This is a really unique cake. It comes from Carol Singer, who's, um, I call her a balabusta. So she's actually part of the Central Synagogue congregation and she got this cake recipe from her sister in Israel and she gave it to us for our most recent book and didn't tell her sister that it was going in the book. So it was a lovely surprise for her, I think, when she saw her recipe in the book. And it's such a good recipe because we all use egg whites from time to time. We might make a pavlova or meringues. Um, some people like egg whites for breakfast and you've got egg yolks left over. So anytime I have egg yolks left, left over, I make this dough for the cake and I put it in the freezer. And it's such a great use of egg yolks and it's a good thing to keep in mind. Okay, so let's go through the recipe for the apple cake, all right. How it works is you make a dough and you freeze it in two parts and you need to freeze it for a couple of hours, which we couldn't, why we couldn't do this as a cook along. And you make the apple filling, which I'll go through, and then you grate the frozen dough into the tin, okay, on the bottom, one piece. Put your apple filling, you grate the rest of it on the top and then you put cinnamon sugar and then you bake it. And everyone who I've made this for over the last few years says to me that it tastes like haroset, the cake. And it really does because it's got apples and sultanas and coconut, not that that's a haroset thing, but I think it's the, the apples and the sultanas, it just has that flavour. But we're actually making it even more like haroset. And I know I'm mixing my festivals, but instead of the jam that's in the original recipe filling, I have subbed in honey just because it's Rosh Hashanah and we should. And now it really tastes like haroset. And you could even add walnuts as well. They would go beautifully in the filling. I haven't today. All right, so let's talk about the, um, the dough. We have our three egg yolks that I spoke about earlier. And if you do have egg yolks, you can leave them in the fridge for quite a few days if you use your egg whites for something else. I just put them, put them in a glass like this, cover it with plastic wrap and put it in the fridge. Okay, we have half a cup of caster sugar. I always use caster sugar for baking as a general rule because I find it dissolves quicker. I, it's easy to get, it's available. If you don't have it, white sugar is absolutely fine. Um, Adele, if you don't have sultanas, yes, absolutely. Craisins would be fine. Not that I actually know what craisins are. are they are they dried cranberries, maybe? Perhaps that's what they are. Yeah, they would be perfect in it. Any dried fruit would be absolutely lovely. Um, you need the sweetness of the dried fruit because there's not a lot of sugar in the filling. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Don't want to use that flour, do I? We've got some vanilla. I never, as a general rule, measure vanilla. I've just got a little jar of it and I just tip it in and guess. So we're going to have a, if you want to measure one teaspoon of vanilla extract, Interestingly, very unconventionally, this has butter that's been melted and cooled. It's not at all usual for a dough or a cake, and I quite like that. It just makes it something different. If you're using margarine, though, I suggest you just 
leave it out of the fridge and use softened margarine instead of the melted butter. I did make this with margarine a couple of weeks ago and it worked perfectly well. The only caveat is that it's really harder to grate because it, the dough melts so or softens so much quicker. So you might have to keep putting it back in the freezer or flour your hands. You'll see what I mean when I grate this one. Okay, so we have got so far egg yolks, caster sugar, vanilla, butter, self-raising flour. We have got 170 grams or one cup and a bit. And no, that doesn't go with that. And that's it, right? Is that everything for the, and some salt. Um, okay, so I've got, let me just go through this. Egg yolks, sugar, vanilla, butter, self-raising flour and salt which is already in my flour, okay? Now, the way we make this, and I haven't actually got a bowl to make it, which is very silly of me. Is we're gonna start off, and I'm not gonna use the machine now because it's just noisy. I am gonna do it by hand, but honestly, if I was doing this at home, I would definitely do it in my stand mixer, okay? Um, how much butter it was, sorry, 115 grams. I didn't say 115 grams of butter. So in here, I'm going to put my three egg yolks. And to that, I'm going to add my sugar. Um, now, just a word of warning. If you're getting everything ready, don't put your sugar on top of your egg, egg yolks and then go away and do something because what will happen is, it's called burning, it's not actually burning, but all the protein in the eggs will be affected by the sugar and you'll get these grains that you just won't get out of and you'll eat your pastry and you might taste these grains. So either whisk, start to whisk your eggs before you add the sugar or just put them together and whisk them, okay? So we're adding together, we're mixing together egg yolks and sugar it sort of comes to be a taste. And again, do it in the machine by all means. I'm going to add my vanilla now, about a teaspoon. It's a lovely vanilla speckled pastry. I'm using vanilla extract and it's got the specks of vanilla in it, but you can use vanilla um, essence if that's what you've got, okay? So we're just doing this till it's light and fluffy. Are we doing it by hand, everyone? I guess no one's doing this one with me, so I'm just doing it to show you. And it's very easy because, it's, you know, they, they lighten very quickly and it becomes a smooth mixture in about a minute. This is my workout for the day, actually, for my arm. So just let me get to it. Okay, and next I'm going to add in the butter and then the flour. And something like eggs and sugar and butter, you can really beat it a lot without overbeating it. But once you add the flour, you've got to start to take care. It's a very, very interesting cake. And I'm happy that I'm showing it to you because it's one of those things that you really, when you read the recipe, you go, really? Really? Is that how it works? You'll see what I mean. Um, one teaspoon of vanilla essence would be great. Okay. So that's light and quite a bit. My eggs are very lovely and yellow, so they've gone down nice and pale. Now I'm going to add in the melted butter. If you find you're mixing and you want your bowl to not move, just put something underneath it and, well, it usually works. Okay. So we're just mixing the butter in. Okay. It's going in. Again, if you are using margarine, just put the margarine in without melting it and just give it a really good mix. There's one of my dots. Okay, we've got a lovely, really looks like a beautiful pale yellow batter. Now I'm unfolding the flour. And again, I'm gonna start with half like I always do. And just fold it in nicely. This is the part where I don't want to mix it like mad, okay? I want to be very gentle with the flour. I don't need to be as gentle as if I'm making a chiffon cake and the egg white gentleness. It's just, I just don't want to beat it too much, okay? Putting in the rest of it, that's all the flour done. And you might think, how on earth is that going to be a dough that I can grate? And it's a really good question because it actually... <laughs> You'll see what I mean in a minute. It's very, very, very soft. 
But as soon as we put it on the bench in a second with some flour, extra flour, you'll see that it does come together to form a dough. And once it's frozen, it's, it's perfect to, to grate. Okay, so the thing about this is you'll be pleased to know that you don't have to sit here for two hours while it's in, it goes in the freezer. I have done one ahead. So as soon as this goes in the freezer, I will pull out the one I did ahead. So now I want to show you what this looks like. It's like it's like a thick cake batter, okay? That's what it looks like now. And you think it doesn't look like a dough at all. But what I'm going to do is put quite a bit of flour. It's probably about a quarter of a cup of flour onto my bench. And I'm going to scrape all the dough onto the bench. Okay. I remember the first time I made it, I thought, look, there's no way this is going to be a dough. The recipe must be wrong. But you know what? Surprise, surprise, it's not. It actually works beautifully. So again, I'm taking a bit more of that extra flour on my hands. And in about 20 seconds, I have a dough that's able to be cut in half and wrapped and put in the freezer. It's very soft, as you can see. I couldn't, probably couldn't roll it out and cut cookies if I wanted to, just to give you an idea of the softness of the dough, but it's perfect. Now, if you can, I would actually weigh the dough and divide it, but if you really don't mind, if your top and your bottom aren't exactly the same, then you can just have a guess, cut it in half, and yes, I know too much plastic wrap and wrap them up. Think about when you're going to grate it, what shape you want it to be in. And I've tried it in logs to see if that's easier and I've tried it in a disc. To me, I think the disc is the easiest. Um, you want it in a piece that you can grate it without grating your knuckles. That's really the aim here. So I've all done that and that's very, very unpleasant. <laughs> I'm sure all of you who have done that are just wincing at the thought of it. You know, we've grated, um, you know, you're grating an apple and you just get your knuckles and you've got to throw everything out and you've got to start again and it hurts so much. So you've got to take care when you're grating this. All right, these are going in the freezer now. Let me just clean up my edge. So dough goes in the freezer. Let's fast forward two hours. Okay, yes, Robin, that's a very good question. Can you grate it in the food processor? Would you believe that I've been making this cake for a long time and today was the first day I did it in the food processor? I thought it would actually damage the blade because it's so hard, but it was actually, it was unbelievable. It did, it, it did the job. Not only did it do it quicker, but it did it better than grating by hand. All right, let me get the apples. So I have done... We need five Granny Smith apples for the filling. And they can sit for ages. I don't mind if they sit in the colander for a while because I want the juice to come out. I don't want the juice in the cake. So I put them in a colander and they go brown and it doesn't matter. And the juice comes out, which is lovely to drink if you like apple juice. I just wanted to show you quickly, and I'm sure you all know this, but I'll just show you the quick way <laughs> It's actually, I don't even know why I'm showing you, but I'm showing you anyway how, to, how I peel an apple. This is my mad method. I just take the bottom bits off first, the top bits of the skin off, right? And then you've got that, and you just have to go down the side like that. So that's it. It's just I find that quicker. Some people are really talented. I remember my mother used to be able to peel an orange with a knife in one piece, okay? And I think she did an apple the same way, and I think that's quite talented. I do not have that talent. So I'm doing it like this. And I just find this, when I've got to do 20 apples, this is just a quick and easy way to do it. Sort of methodically, you know, methodical. You do the top, you do the bottom, and then you go down the sides. Okay? And then I just grate it. I keep it like this in one piece. And I grate it. I'll do it onto this board, which you can see. avoiding my knuckles okay and the best way to avoid knuckles is to use the palm of your hand and push whatever you're grating against the grater rather than like that try to use your palm okay so I just grate all around the core it 
does feel like Pesach when you're grating apples, I have to say. Harosset, harosset, harosset. Okay, so that's it. Apple is grated. I'm just going to put that into the colander. Clean up my mess. So apples grated. And let it sit there while you get the rest of the filling ingredients ready, okay? We need sultanas or craisins or dried apricots, if you like. Anything sweet, any sweet dried fruit would be great. You could even use dates. We have got the grated zest of one lemon. We have got two tablespoons of desiccated or shredded coconut, and I am using shredded. I've got one teaspoon of ground cinnamon. And the recipe says three tablespoons of plum jam, but instead of plum jam, I'm going to use honey. And you can use two to three tablespoons, to spend, depends how sweet you want it, okay? And I think the honey is a really, really good addition for Rosh Hashanah. I absolutely love it. Okay, so my apples, I'm just going to give them a squeeze to get out the excess juice because I don't want it in. <laughs> you are welcome, honey. Um, that's to Lorraine. Thank you for your question and calling me honey, honey. All right. So I'm squeezing it all out. I mean, I don't need to drain it and wrap it in, wrap it in a tea towel and squeeze it out that way. It's not that important to get every drop out, but I do want to get most of it out, okay, like that. So let me just put this aside in a glass for drinking for later. And I'm going to put the apple in that bowl. Thanks. Now, to my apple, I'm going to add all my other ingredients. My sultanas or dried fruit that you're using. Stuck. My coconut, my cinnamon, and my lemon zest. Uh, it's the cinnamon that also makes people think it tastes like carotin. It's actually the apple and the cinnamon combo. And that's it. Let me just double check. check. Double check. I have five Granny Smith apples. I have three tablespoons of either plum jam, but I haven't put the honey in yet, so I will put that in now. I'm just going to guess three tablespoons. I'm going to do two heap tablespoons worth, okay, which I think is the right amount. Cinnamon, lemon, that's it. I would just put my hand in that and just give that a mix. It's the best way when you've got grated apple to get your fingers in there to mix everything nicely, okay? Just think you want every little bit of grated apple coated with the mixture, with the cinnamon, with the honey or the jam if you're using. You want your sultan as well dispersed through the mixture and I find hand very, very useful in this case, okay? So do you see what I'm doing? I'm like squishing it and turning it just like this, all right? Yum. Smells delicious. I hope that I'm making all of you really hungry. That's the idea. And then by the time we're finished, you'll have a beautiful batch of honey biscuits to eat with a cup of tea. All right. So that's it. And I'm just using my fingertips to make sure it's mixed nicely. Okay, mixture is done. Now let's start grating. Um, as Robin pointed out earlier, and as I said, if you can, if you have a strong food processor with a grating attachment, it honestly makes a tedious job much easier. And this is probably the most tedious part of this cake. And whenever I make the cake, I sort of roll my eyes and think, oh, I've got a great pastry. But anyway, it's fine. I want to show you, this is the pastry that I did earlier in the food processor. It's like the finest shredded cheese. It's unbelievable. And you'll see when I do it by hand, it's just not as nice. So I'm going to leave that aside for a minute. We need a 20 centimetre spring form tip, just like this, and I have lined the base of it. Okay, can you assemble the cake and freeze it, or would you freeze it once it's baked? Good question. I just worry about freezing fresh apple. I don't know what would happen to that. So I'd probably bake the whole cake, wrap it well, call it, wrap it and freeze it already, already baked. Um, okay, did I put the grated pastry back in the fridge? No, I've just left it here for the moment because I'm going to use it in a minute. 
Okay, I'm gonna, this is my disc. So pretend this is the one I just made. It looks the same. It's been in the freezer since last night and it's solid. How hard it is. But because of the warmth of your hand, it starts to melt quickly. Um, and I'm using the, the big side of the, of the box braid grater. Um, Hadassah, I don't know. I don't know much about the thermomix. I'm sorry, I don't do it, so I can't answer that. I'm sorry, I'm not a thermomix person. All right, and so it's just a matter of grating it, and it's really quite hard work. So if you have got the food processor, you should do it. Um, okay, Haley's asked whether you can make the cake with other pastry. Could absolutely, you could make that as a filling for a pie. It would be absolutely delicious. You could make that, put that in a baking dish and make a crumble topping and put it on top. Um, it's a really, really nice filling, but just remember it's not very sweet. So you need to have a pastry or a topping that has some sugar in it for sweetness, I think. All right, you can see that this is very, I mean, it works all right. And I'm just gonna start to put this in the base of the tin, okay? Remember we divided the dough in half in two parts, one's for the bottom and one's for the top. And I'll just carry on. You're probably all sitting there having a cup of tea and I'm working hard grating this frozen lump of pastry. I shouldn't complain. It's actually a beautiful recipe, but it is a bit of a work to do it. I'm not going to lie to you, um, which is why I did one of them ahead of time in the food processor. I can't see that's going to be the best highlight of your week is to watch me grate pastry. So you only have to watch me do one of them, okay? And I'm just going to put it in there as I go. With margarine, it's much harder. And so what I suggest you do is actually cut your half in half, leave half in the freezer and do half at a time with floured hands, okay? Um, it just melts much quicker and gets a bit soft. Um you know what, it's not quite like grating cheese. I think it's harder work than grating cheese because A, it's cold and it hurts your hand. And B, you've got to work quickly because you don't want it to start to melt. So you don't want the butter to melt. So this is, I'm going to be schwitzing in a minute. <laughs> okay. So I want this to be, I want it to cover the base. Okay. That's what I'm doing. And what it does, it gives the cake at the end a beautiful texture. And I'll, oh, you'll be pleased to know you don't have to wait 45 minutes for me to bake this cake. I have baked one ahead. So I'm going to, you know, do like we do on television, put it in the oven and pull out one that's already made. Okay. So now I'm going to be careful and watch my knuckles and watch my hands because there's nothing worse. Okay. And also by hand, you do get a bigger... You get bigger pieces. The food processor did a, a sterling job. All right. So here we go. I'm nearly done. Nearly done. How are we going, everyone? Are we having fun yet? <laughs> Watching the great dough. Okay. Nearly done. See, it's not so bad because I only have to do one of them. Okay. And then you can even taste, take these bits that are hard to grate and just tear them into little bits and put them in the edges of the cake and that's fine. It's just a dough. It's just a different way of, of making the base of the cake. So if there's a few little lumps in there, it doesn't matter. They'll cook nicely together and you won't even know, I promise you. Okay, so you can see the base. I'm using my fingertips just to cover the base completely. There are a few holes of which I'm not worried about at all. That is done. Okay, now I take my beautiful filling which interestingly, as it sits here, it, it just gets more liquid. So I want to squeeze it out because um, I want to leave the liquid behind. So Ingrid, if you don't want coconut, just leave it out. Just absolutely leave it out. It'll be no problem at all. Okay, and I'm just going to sprinkle all this mixture, spread it onto the top of the grated base. Yum, 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 yum. Already looks fantastic and it's not even cooked. Yeah, so whoever asked about freezing it, I think I and I would worry that the frozen apple would, I don't know, you know, if you, if you did freeze it at this point, once you put the dough on top, I would bake it straight from the freezer. It might work. Look, I guess the only way to find out is to try it. Um, the freezer sometimes does surprise me with what it can do, I must say. And I think it's going to ruin something and it actually doesn't. All right, so that's that. And then, oh, oops. 
sorry, hands again. And then we just put the rest of it on top. It's lovely, lovely, finely shredded pastry. It's amazing, actually, this one, the dough. So different. Can't believe I've been making it for all these years and actually didn't realise I could do it in the food processor. I'm not sure why it just crossed my mind. Anyway, okay, this is actually doing really well. I've got a few lumps in here also. Even the food processor can't do the last few bits, but it doesn't matter because it's a very beautiful rustic cake, okay, and it doesn't matter if there's big lumps and different things. It'll all just look fabulous. Okay, so you can see it's not perfect. It doesn't have to be perfect. That is what it looks like. I'm going to press it down a tiny bit, not pushing, just lightly pressing. And you can see what it looks like. Remember, it's self-raising flour, so it's going to rise. So it's not going to look exactly like this when it's finished. Now, we finish this off with cinnamon sugar. And this is something that I have um, in my pantry at all times. I have a jar labelled cinnamon sugar, and it's basically one cup of caster sugar to two tablespoons of ground cinnamon okay it just sits in my pantry for a long time you know months and months and I use it for so many things and we just need a couple of teaspoons sprinkled over the top before baking and this is a challenge actually trying to you try it next when you make this cake try to sprinkle it perfectly evenly it's actually impossible I've tried so many times you could do it in a colander like in a um, medium sort of sieve and do it that way over the top with a teaspoon, it's harder to get it perfect. But we know we're not after perfect. We're after beautiful and rustic and delicious. Okay, this already looks amazing. I'm really happy with this. That's it, cake done. Oven 180 degrees in the oven for about 45 minutes. I suggest if you've got a hot oven or you're not sure, just check it after 35 minutes because I don't like it when people say, you know, I put it in for 45 and I went away and I came back and it was burnt. You know your oven. Every oven is different. So please check it always 10 minutes before the suggested cooking time. I'm going to put mine in for 45 and I'll show you the finished one as soon as we're finished rolling the biscuits. All right. So what's that question? Oh, okay. Let me just put this in here. All right. Right, 45 minutes and put my timer on and let me just clean up my bench. Okay, all right, 45. Okay, um, okay, so um, here we go, 45. No, I don't have Jessie helping me tonight. That's my daughter, Jessie. Jessie's actually doing night shifts at the hospital at the moment, so she is not able to help me cook, which is such a shame. Um, all right, I'm going to put on for 35 minutes. 45 minutes because I know that's how long it takes me. All right. Going to get rid of all of this stuff. And here's the apple juice for someone to drink later. And it's actually very nice, I must say. Very nice. All right. Um, no. Yes. Turned off the hot water. Sorry. <laughs> all right. So, Sorry to interrupt. This is what's called a Zoom bomb. I just wanted to join you to wish you all a Shana Tova. <laughs> Secondly, to say that, and this might seem strange coming from me, I really hope we get to see you all in Shul next year. And finally, and most importantly, the apple cake is to die for. And really, it doesn't matter what else you cook from Lisa's repertoire, the apple cake is a must do. Good night, Shana Tova. <laughs> <laughs> all right that's Danny husband yeah he's been talking about doing that all day like he's I said no Danny please don't do that but he just can't help himself what can I say he's also been pacing the kitchen waiting for the time he can eat the apple cake and I said you can't eat it till after I've shown it to you so you're gonna have to wait Danny till we roll the biscuits all right let's roll the biscuits what you're gonna need is as follows a baking sheet baking tray I'm only going to do a little one because I only need to show you. You can keep rolling and baking all night if you like. I'm just going to show you a handful so that um, you can all get on rolling your own. Um, you're going to need a rolling pin and some extra flour for the bench. If you use um, margarine, I'm going to show you. Can you show me the two? There was one in the freezer and one in the fridge. There's a, that's a freezer. Okay. 
So this is the dough made with margarine, okay? And it's been in the fridge and it's actually, it's actually perfect for rolling, okay? But like I said, when you're grating for the other cake, it goes soft really quickly. So I would only roll it in parts if you're doing margarine. I'd probably take a quarter of the dough, roll it, leave the rest in the fridge, okay? I'm not going to roll those now, but I'm going to show you the one I did with butter. So the one that I put in the fridge is still quite soft. And the one I put in the freezer is, is a bit harder, but I think we can, we're right to go ahead. If you've got time and you can, leave the dough in the fridge. Maybe take a quarter of it now so you can roll it with me and leave the rest in the fridge. The longer it sits in the fridge, up to about an hour or two hours, the easier it will be to roll, okay? So I'm going to show you how I roll it. This is the exact dough I made earlier. There's no trick photography here. Um, and I'm just going to do about a quarter of that. It's a really, really beautiful dough. And I want to show you, I've just cut it. You can see just how lovely it is. It's, you saw me make it and there's no tricks there. It's a really good dough to make, easy to make and super easy to roll out. Now I've got some flour. Is that my flour? Okay. Um, you can roll it on baking paper if you prefer. I prefer to roll on the bench for this because the dough actually is fine, but it's really up to you. I always spread my flour on the bench. I'm looking for my cookie cutters. Ah, yes, thank you. So choose whatever size you like. I like them small. You can make them big, you can make them middle-sized. I like them small because um, then you can just have one with a cup of tea and it's like, like it's nothing, right? And you can eat 10 of them and it's still nothing. So that's what I love about it. So I'm going to flour my rolling pin. I don't want a heap of flour on this. I just want enough so that I can roll it, okay? And I want to keep sure, making sure it can move on the bench while I'm rolling and I'm pressing gently. I'm not squishing it. I'm not smushing it. I'm just rolling it really gently, okay? And I just want to make sure it can move. And I want it to be quite thin because this is a snappy biscuit. And if they're not thin, they can still be snappy, but you've got to cook them a bit longer, okay? So let's just roll this out. And I want it to be, if I had to say in millimetres, which is sort of hard to judge, I'd say three-ish, give or take. And I'm just going to use my cookie cutter to cut out and put them on my tray just like this. And you can see how easy and how well the dough works and how it's actually um, very smooth. So why is your dough cracking, Haley? Okay, the first question is, um, did you weigh your ingredients or measure them by cup? Sometimes if you measure by cup, it's not as exact as if you weighed them and perhaps there's a bit too much flour in there. Um, what you can do if it is cracking is put it onto the bench and give it a bit of a knead with your hands and then wrap it up again and put it in the fridge to rest again. Otherwise, you can just try to roll a quarter of it out and see how it goes. Um, it, it shouldn't crack. You can see it's a very, it starts off a very soft dough. Oops, and it firms up really nicely in the fridge. Okay. So that'll do for now because I want to show you actually what they look like baked. So I've got my lovely, you always like it to be in a grid and to be an even number. So I've got 12, just like that. I'm going to put them in 180 degrees. Have we got the other shelf in there? No. I've just got to put my other shelf in the oven. Okay. I'm going to put them in for 10 minutes. So I'm going to take my timer off uh, the cake and I'm going to put my biscuits in for 10. Okay, how are we going for time? Excellent. Okay, so you can take your time because we are not, no one's waiting for you to bake your biscuits. So you take your time and roll them slowly. I want to just cover a few things here. 
So my oven, no. So you can use your fan if you want. Mine is 180 degrees, a conventional temperature. So if you're doing it in the fan, I would do 160 or 165. Okay, so I'll hold up the dough to show you. That's a good idea. Can you see that? So it's probably two to three millimetres, I would say. And you can see how robust in a way the dough is. It doesn't smush or anything. It's cut out nicely. And that was only in the fridge for half an hour. What to do with the scraps? So I find with biscuits, sometimes when you re-roll the scraps, they're a bit tough because again, the gluten's been overworked. So what I like to do is to collect the scraps and just put them aside either on the bench or put them back in the fridge and then start on another piece. And at the end, put all the scraps together and roll them. So that's what I prefer to do. I wanna show you another idea. So I thought it might be worth trying. For those of us who really can't be bothered rolling out and, and uh, cutting, you know, using a cookie cutter, some biscuits you can actually make a log and then you can cut it, um, you know, like uh, make little rounds. And this works actually quite well. I've actually got them here. The only thing is, is that it's got to be frozen or just off frozen, okay? Because otherwise what happens if you just put it in the fridge and you cut circles, you squish it as you cut it and they end up really weird shape, okay? So it's also hard to get them uniform, but you can see you can cut them like that. If you don't want to roll and you don't want to use a cookie cutter, and if it's too much of an effort, which I get for some people it is, you can do it this way. Make a lovely log, wrap it in glad wrap and stick it in the freezer. This has been out of the freezer for probably, I don't know, five minutes? No, two minutes, two, three minutes, okay? And then you just slice them off like that. Okay, um, okay, so Iris, if yours have been in the fridge for an hour, you're definitely ready to roll and bake, okay? Go ahead. Okay, so that is a few ideas with the cookies. Any more questions about the rolling before I go on? Um, it's interesting the margarine also makes the dough a different colour. It's a much lighter colour. I use Natalex, um, which is the margarine I use when I test all my recipes with, with um with margarine instead of butter. I really do prefer butter for this biscuit though. It really is lovely. Okay, good question. The cookies do spread in the oven, so don't put them close to each other. And if you put them close to each other, all that will happen is that they'll join and you'll have, um, you know, a tray of one cookie, I guess. But what happened to me um, a few weeks ago, I was doing a demo of another biscuit that also has leavening agent in it. And I was telling everyone, you know, don't put them too close together, make sure they're apart. And I put them on the cookie tray quite close together because I just wasn't thinking. And anyway, I put them in the oven, came out. Honestly, I had a tray of square biscuits because they all joined and the only way to get them apart was to break them and they were literally square biscuits not very attractive so yes leave some space between them you'll see when i pull them out all right let me show you um these are the ones i baked last night um no this is the dough i made last night and i baked them today these are margarine dough and i used a cookie cutter with a scalloped edge to try to get a pattern but you see because they rise they don't really get a great pattern um, but I want to show you, this is, I'm going to put it next to the microphone. Okay, you see they're snappy. Not as good as with butter. I'm going to say it again. So if you want something, um, Parov for Rosh Hashanah, make the cake with margarine rather than butter and save these as butter biscuits if you can. Um, but these are the biscuits. They look lovely. And you'll see the, the butter ones when they come out in a few minutes. So they're just the cookies with margarine. It works perfectly. Hinder, yes, you can leave the dough in the fridge overnight. You can leave it in for a few days, probably two, three days would be fine. If you're not going to use it, stick it in the freezer. Don't forget to label it, though. I do it all the time. I put dough or something in the freezer. I think I'll remember that that's, you know, the nut tart pastry. And then three weeks later, I'll look at this blob of dough in the freezer and I've got no idea what it is. So please wrap it, put it in a plastic bag and write the texture or whatever on the bag what it is, you know. Honey snap dough and put the date on it as well. It's good to know. All right. So let me show you while we're waiting for the while we're waiting for the biscuits to bake, let me show you the finished cake. It's really, really 
does my dog want something attention probably all right so this is the finished cake and it's really really beautiful you can see the top i mean it's very rustic if you don't like the look of the top you can of course sprinkle some icing sugar over the top if you want it to look pretty it's really such a lovely cake okay and you could even make smaller versions of this cake quite easily. You could make them in muffin tins if you wanted to make sort of small ones as gifts. You just have to line them with baking paper because you may not get them out. And it's really, really lovely. I want to show you what it looks like inside. I've made this cake a few times for friends over the years and everyone really, really goes mad for it. Um, yeah, where did I buy that cookie cutter combo? It's a really good one. I bought it at Williams Sonoma years ago. It's fantastic. It's really, really good. If they still sell them, it's worth finding, it's worth buying one. They've been, it's been amazing. I use it all the time. Okay, so I'm going to cut a nice big piece of cake. Just on the baking paper front, this is the baking paper that it was baked on in the tin. I always keep it on it and I quite like that look rather than just having to worry about putting it from the tin onto the cake stand. I just literally pick up the baking paper from the tin and put it on and it looks, I think it looks really nice. It's a really nice look. Okay, back to this piece of cake. Um, if you are making this cake dairy, it is beautiful with a dollop of Greek yogurt or a dollop of creme fraiche or thick or sorry whipped cream it really really goes so well and you can see you can see the two layers the dough the pastry i should say or the cake sort of is now on the bottom and the top see it's a real combo between a pie and a cake which makes it really really interesting and it's really really a lovely lovely cake and you know i'm not going to eat it now although I do usually eat in front of everybody, but today I'm not going to because I want to show you the inside, how nice it looks, okay? So that is the apple pie cake, perfect for Rosh Hashanah with apples and honey and everything we need for a sweet new year. And my biscuits are going to be ready in just a moment. Let me have a piece. Oh, they look so perfect. I'm very happy to say. Any more questions while we're waiting for my biscuits to cook? I'm happy to ask anything. Um, Hayley says she never knows whether to book top, whether to cook top or bottom rack. As a general rule, I bake in the middle of the oven unless there's a reason I want it at the top. If I want the top to brown more, I'll put it at the top. And if I want the top to brown less, I'll put it at the bottom. But generally, I'm a middle of the oven person. Um, the baking tray that I put in, oh, yeah, you know what? It's an English one. I can't remember the name, but I went looking on Google last week to buy another one. I've had it for about 30 years. And they don't sell them in Australia, so I can't even buy one. So it's a bit sad. Um, okay, so any other questions? Very happy to answer them. Um, if you are on Instagram and you follow Monday Morning CC, which is the Monday Morning Cooking Club account, I'm doing pretty much daily free cooking classes at 11.30 most days. Um, and I'd love you to join in. You've got to be on Instagram to watch them on Insta Live. Um, and this week we're doing, of course, Rosh Hashanah things. Um, so please, if you haven't had enough cooking, please come back tomorrow at 11.30 to Instagram because I'd love to share more things with you. Um, the ratio of cinnamon sugar was two tablespoons of cinnamon to one cup of caster sugar. And it just sits in my pantry all the time. Okay, so about the oven. I didn't say not to use fan frost. I said I'm not using fan frost. You can... There's nothing wrong with using the fan for this biscuit, but my oven's an old one. And I find that I actually use the fan, but it's a conventional temperature. So if you've got a fan frost oven that's reasonably recent, you know, the last five so years, they're really powerful. So you've got to reduce the temperature. So that's why I say it's a conventional temperature, not a fan temperature, if that makes sense. Okay, that's 10 minutes. Um, Okay, so tomorrow or Monday, you said Iris, the cooking thing? Yeah, tomorrow. I do every day at 11.30, tomorrow and Friday. And I'm not up to Monday yet, actually. 
I'm not sure what I'm going to do Monday. It's area of Rosh Hashanah. I'm not sure. So these are my biscuits. You can see they've puffed up beautifully. They haven't spread too much. Well, two of them are now touching. But you can see how lovely they are and how easy they are to make. And I'm going to let them cool. If you wanted to use your tray again, I would then put them onto a rack to cool. Otherwise, you can just leave them on the rack, on the baking tray to cool. Uh, the brand of this is actually Silverwood. And it's a fantastic tray. But can't get them at the moment. So that is that. I have shown you some beautiful honey snap biscuits, which are a real treat. And the recipe makes a lot. You're going to make about 90 of that size, which is a lot of biscuits. Um, can you sprinkle caster sugar on the cake instead of icing? Of course you can. Absolutely. Why not? Caster sugar is lovely. It does, and it does add a different texture, which is also nice. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here tonight. It's been so nice for our community to all be together. And I wish everyone a Shana Tova. And uh, let's all hope that the coming year is, um, you know, happy and healthy, particularly for all of us. Let's focus on the health and hopefully the pandemic will still soon be behind us. Keep safe, everybody. And thank you, Lynn, for organising this. Thank you, Liz, for doing this. Um, it's been, as always, pure joy. Thank you. I hope. I want to say one more thing about the biscuits, though. If yours don't snap, okay, it's hard to tell because they don't snap when they come out of the oven. They're soft when they come out because they're still warm. What I suggest you do is do a small batch like I did and let them cool completely. Check if they're snappy and then you know you've got the temperature right. But you could probably cook them for a couple more minutes, maybe for 10 or maybe for 12 minutes or 13 minutes, and that would be the right amount of time. You've got to judge on your oven. I can't judge. They need to be golden brown all the way through. That's really important, okay? Um, I hope they work. I'm sure they'll work. And the only thing that could go wrong is that you just haven't cooked them quite long enough, so just put them back in. I think you've all got an evening of rolling and cutting out biscuits ahead of you. I know I have. I've got to get through all this dough. Um, it's been wonderful. If there's no more questions, then I will say good night and thank you for having me. And Shana Shabbat.